thank you. Yeah, as Jared said, my name is Philip. I'm his younger brother, and some of you might recognize me. I've been coming here for the last, what, 11 years, 10 years you guys have been here? And I think I have a little bit more facial hair every time I come, so maybe in 10 more years I'll have an actual beard, not this ghost beard I've got on my face right now. But uh, I'm excited to be here with you all. Again, thank you for having me, Jared. Um, I just want to take a quick minute and just kind of acknowledge my brother. It's It may be a little weird for siblings to actually have respect for siblings. I don't know if, if that's a thing, but um, Jared and Hillary are wonderful people. And Jared is not just a brother to me, but he is somebody that I look up to for spiritual guidance and significance because I see the value and the heart that's within him. And yes, I'm making him cry right now, so that's a win. Um, but I just want to honor them, and, and you guys truly are blessed to have them both here um, serving this church the last uh, 10 years. It's hard to believe it's already been 10 years. Um, time goes by fast. Like he said, uh, I've been married for the last seven years. I have three kids, Theo who's four, Wesley is two, he's in the back. Um, I see him through the little window there. He's cute as ever. Uh, and then we have a little girl, Penelope. She's eight months old. And I don't have any pictures or anything, but trust me, they are all really, really cute. Um, waking up this morning, I was seeing the snow. I looked at the forecast before I came for my hometown, and it didn't say snow. Uh, and I woke up, and I was like, what is all this white stuff on the ground? This is not what I expected. So if you're ever traveling, look at the place you're going to for the weather. <laughs> Uh, not where you're at, so especially if you're going to go to Florida, you might pack too heavy in February if you do that. But I was reminded of Isaiah 1, 18, when I saw this note. It says, come now and let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. If they are red as crimson, they will become like wool. And that's just a good reminder. Every time there's a big snowfall, I'm always reminded of that. And especially after the sin that the Packers offense committed last night, <laughs> let's be reminded that they are forgiven also for the complete stinker they laid last night. That was a bummer. But, but again, thank you all for having me here. I really appreciate it. I'm going to pray, and then we'll go into it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for uh, the opportunity to come and to share and to speak. God, I, I pray that uh, the words that are shared this morning are from you, they are not from me, and the words that are from me that you don't intend, that you don't want to be heard, that you would just, Lord, let it fall away, and that the words that you have and you desire to speak, that your spirit would grab them and would minister to the hearts and the minds that are here this morning. Lord, we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, to kind of set the stage this morning here, I've really been thinking and praying about just church and life in general. I'd been a worship pastor at my church back in Austin, part-time. I stepped down from that recently to focus full-time, help support my wife going through grad school right now. That's why she's home. Uh, she's working on her, her capstone course right now, so that is taking up a lot of time. So I wanted to give her time for that. But I've just really been thinking about the church and what is church and what does church mean and what is church for all of us, big C, little C, what does it all, all mean? And when I was thinking about this morning when Jared had uh, asked me to speak, it was really like, Lord, what do, you, what do you want this to be? What do you want this to look like? And the thing that just kind of kept coming up was that I, I really I hope and pray that this morning would be uh, a message of preparation for River City, that I, I get a sense, and I don't know if it's me or if it's the Spirit, but that there is growth and that there is health coming for this church, and it will continue and it will grow on. Um, and, and I know the desire for me and for Jared and for others that we see the church grow not just from people coming from other churches to fill the pews and be, oh, awesome, look at all of our numbers, we're growing. Where did you come from? Oh, I've been in church my whole life. I've been saved my whole life. This is great. That doesn't necessarily expand the kingdom. It shifts the kingdom. And that doesn't grow the church. It grows our church, but it doesn't grow the church. And so the heart is to grow and bring in people who are either unchurched, that's those who've never been in church, or those that are de-churched is the current term of choice. Those that have been in church, have walked away, and now need to come back to the faith. And so praying and seeking, Lord, what, what is the, the message for today? The, the idea for this morning is to prepare this church. How can we better welcome those who are unchurched or de-churched into this fellowship? And what can we do to prepare our hearts 
for those that need Jesus the most, those that are broken, those that are far, those that are desperate and they need the love and the hope of Jesus Christ, what can we do to make sure that we as believers are prepared to welcome them into our body, to welcome them into this fellowship and into love for God and love for another? So today we're going to do, we're going to look at a church in the Bible that had to deal with this, this issue. You had people that were established believers, established in a faith, and they had a lot of people coming in that were unchurched or were dechurched, and what that, that looked like. So we're going to look at the book of Galatians, and to kind of highlight here the peace and harmony and unity that they had in this church, we're going to look at Galatians 2.11, and it says, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he was wrong. It's a lot of love, right? That's a lot of peace. A lot of harmony in the early church. We always idealize the early church. Oh, man, if we can just get back to the church of Acts. This is the church of Acts, people. I opposed him to his face because he was wrong. So we'll look at that. So what is going on here, right? So let's go to backtrack a little bit. So this is Paul. He's writing to the church of Galatia, and that's either a a group of people, or it's a region in Turkey. We're not quite sure exactly how it means. We kind of know roughly where it's at. But Paul's writing to this church that he had founded. And now when Paul would go do ministry, he would go to a town, and he would go into a synagogue. And if there is a synagogue, that means there's at least 10 Jewish families in a town. So he's going to a town that's got a church, and he's going in the church, and he's preaching to them Christ. And so he goes to the Jews first, and he says, hey, there's the Messiah, I'm coming and I'm talking about him, there's a new way to live, it's awesome, whoever would take it, they would take the faith, those that wouldn't, he would then move on to the Gentiles. So everywhere Paul went, he always had a church that was ethnically and theologically diverse by just the nature of what he did. So he would have Jews, and he would have Gentiles in every single church, just by the method that he went into church planning. And we can see a glimpse of this. If you notice when you read Paul's letters, he always introduces them with grace and peace. Grace and peace. And that's not just like a nice, pretty greeting that he's doing. The words that he's using there are very significant. He's saying grace, which is Greek charis. So he's addressing the Gentiles. And he's saying peace, which is shalom. And he's addressing the Jews. So when you see grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you, that right there tells you this is a ethnically diverse church. You have Jews, you have Gentiles. There's probably issues in this church. So that's what we're going to look at, is what, what that tension was between the Jews and the Gentiles and how Paul worked through them. Because Galatians is one of Paul's earliest writings, and it's really kind of the, it's the proto-Paul. It's the first of Paul's thoughts. So Galatians is kind of like a prequel to Romans, and it's really Paul's fleshing out all of these ideas. So if you look at Galatians, it's a really, really great primer for all the letters, for all the rest of the New Testament that you read, because Paul wrote basically the entire New Testament. So this is one of the first ones he's doing, he's addressing, and he's working through it. So this this common problem that he had was, again, this tension between Jews and Gentiles. So he goes, he establishes a church in a synagogue, and then he goes and he brings in Gentiles, those that were not Jewish. They're not ethnically Jewish, they're not theologically Jewish. These are pagans in the truest sense of the word, even how you would call somebody a pagan today, these were honest God pagans back then. Um, and they're coming into the church. So you have the, the Jewish population are really, really stringent. You know, we watch what we say, we watch what we eat, we are all in believers. And then you have the Gentiles who life is a mess. They're coming from horrible sexual immorality, practices, worship, and they're like, all right, yeah, Jesus sounds great. Uh, What's this look like? And they're all in the church together. And that causes a lot of tension because everybody comes into church with their own cultural baggage, their own cultural importance, and their own thoughts about how to live life and how to live faith. And so you have this happen in Galatia where Paul goes in and Paul plants the church. He disciples people for a couple years. He kind of deals with these issues. And then Paul goes on because Paul is a church planter. He's not a long-term pastor. So he goes and he establishes these communities, he disciples people to bring them in, and then he leaves and leaves the local church to manage itself. And so what would end up happening is Paul would leave and then people would come in behind him 
who maybe want to make money, who maybe want to preach something else, or they think something is more important. So then what happens in Galatia is Paul leaves, he goes on to plant other churches, and you can see in Acts his progression of that journey. And then people come in behind and they say, yeah, Paul's really great, but we have a pretty awesome message that's even better because, you know, Paul only talked about Jesus. He only talked about Christ and him crucified. He didn't really touch on how you should live, but we're coming from the Jewish background. And we can tell you right now, everybody really needs to be Jewish. If you're a guy, you need to get circumcised. Now, that's probably not a great church growth strategy today. If you were to go, that's a really great way to just not grow your church. If you go and just tell everybody, this is what you got to do with your body, guys. That church is not growing. But apparently it worked a little bit back then. People were obviously more committed, I guess, back then. Because I would be like, all right, I'm done. All right, yeah, that was good. That was fun. I'm going to go back to my old faith. Um, so you have this happening where Paul, he leaves, these people come in, and the, the term he uses and we translate it as, it's called, uh, they're, they're known as the Judaizers. They're coming in and they're encouraging people. You've got to be Christian, yeah, but to be fully Christian, you need to be fully Jewish as well. So you need to take on the culture, you need to take on the practices, the customs, all these other things in order to live a full, robust faith. Everybody with me? Yes. All right, awesome. And so we have here in the beginning of Galatians, we see Paul says, grace and peace to you. I love you all. This is so great. I've been thinking about you, praying about you. And then as soon as he's done with that, he says in verse 6, chapter 1, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ to follow another gospel. He comes out swinging. Like, can you imagine if, if Jared came up and he was like, good morning, everybody. You all are terrible human beings. And that's how I'm opening. You have abandoned the faith, and we're going to deal with this right now, all of you, one at a time. I'm going to call out your sins. Again, not a great growth strategy, right? This is not going to get a conference in church circles here as a method. Maybe in some denominations, I don't know, but not, not in ours um, that we're in. So Paul says this, and in verse 8, and I love, verse 8 is one of my favorites of all time. He says, however, even if we ourselves or a heavenly angel should ever preach anything different from what we preach to you, they should be under a curse. And I love that. This is just a quick aside. There's a lot of religions that start with angelic revelations. And Paul says, even if an angel comes to you and tells you that Christ is not king, that Christ was not crucified, that Christ is not the only way to faith, they should be cursed. If I do it, if I change my mind that that's not all that it is, I should be cursed. So this is just a quick aside. If people come to you and they say, oh, I have a vision, and that vision draws them from Christ, that's not of God. It could be the most amazing experience they have ever had in their life. They could be literally touched by an angelic being. But if it tells them to not follow Jesus, it is not of God. Amen? That's a quick aside. That's not in the notes there. All right, so Paul comes out because he sees that they're drifting from the faith. And we know from 1 Corinthians 1 that Paul taught a very simple very Christ-centric message. He told them, I preached Christ and him crucified. I knew nothing from you. So this is an attack that people would have when they come in from Paul. They say, well, Paul's just not very smart, right? He only talked about Jesus. We can talk about angels because we're that smart. Paul's not very smart at all, even though Paul was probably the smartest theologian at the time. He had all the trainings. He had like seven doctorates. He was the smartest guy that is why God knocked him off a horse and said, that's my guy. Paul was the perfect apostle to choose. But he humiliated, he humbled himself so that he could minister to people. And the people would come in behind and go, yeah, well, Paul's just not very smart, though. Because, you know, he maybe has a stutter. He's not the most eloquent. Um, but look at me. I'm very articulate. So you can trust me, right? So they come in, and, and it would work. These people would come in, and you see in 2 Corinthians and all these others, a lot of it was profit-motivated. These people were coming in because they just wanted to make money. And there were these traveling preachers, traveling prophets, and they'd go to these churches behind Paul, and they would just make some money telling these people what they wanted to hear. And so Paul would have to then, that's why we have the New Testament. We'd have all these problems, and Paul has to write a letter. So I guess thank God for problems that we have a whole New Testament to read for our, our problems we have now which unsurprisingly are these same problems after 2,000 years. So Paul in chapter 1, he has to give a defense for his ministry. Again, people are saying, oh, Paul's not very smart. Or they say, oh, well, Paul doesn't, he doesn't ask you to be Jewish because he's not very Jewish himself, really. Like, he's just not, 
He's not really all in. He's not invested. He didn't really come from a very Jewish family. And so Paul, in, again, a lot of other letters, he defends himself. But in Galatians here, he says, am I trying to win over human beings or God? Am I trying to please people? Because if I was still trying to please people, I wouldn't be serving Christ because my message isn't that awesome. I'm not trying to please them. And then he says in verse 14, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my peers because I was much more militant about the traditions of my ancestors. Paul was a domestic terrorist for Judaism. He killed Christians. He murdered Christians. He was all in in the faith. But he didn't necessarily talk about that because who he was didn't matter to him Who he was in Christ was all that mattered. So he would go, and he wouldn't have to give this huge, amazing testimony about, I used to murder people, and now I serve Jesus, because he would just say, just serve Jesus. It doesn't matter what I've done, just serve Jesus. It doesn't matter what anybody's done, just serve Jesus. Everything about Paul was so Christ-centric. And so then people would come in. Well, Paul's not Jewish. He was very Jewish. In Philippians 3, he gives his, he defends his Jewishness, and it, honestly, it reads like a prize fighter introduction. He's like, I am Hebrew with a Hebrew, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. I am Jewish, yeah. And because he, he doesn't tell people that. And so he's, again, every single letter, he's almost dealing with all these problems. So in, in chapter one, that's what Paul's doing. He's defending himself. He is defending against these accusations. He's letting them know, no, I'm actually very Jewish. Um, I was very militant about my faith. uh, And I'm not trying to please people because they would say, oh, well, you know, Paul's just trying to please people because he's not asking anybody to convert to Judaism because he just wants to make friends and be nice and he doesn't want to impose on people. And Paul in Galatians is saying, no, I'm I'm not imposing Judaism on people because I'm trying to be nice. It's because it's not necessary. It's not needed. So then he, he goes into Galatians 2 and he tells this story about his, his, basically his credentials in Christianity now. So he moves and he establishes his past. He says, I was very Jewish. I was very militant. And then I came to the faith and I met with Peter, who's very well known in the faith. He's you know, one of the apostles. They would have heard about him. None of the gospels were written at this point, but the stories of Christ were well known and the disciples would have been well known. So people would have known who Peter and James and John were And so Paul starts doing some name dropping in chapter 2. Like, oh, you've heard about these guys? Yeah, I met them. Yeah, actually, I I knew them, and they uh, they welcomed me, and they said, hey, good message. Go out and go out in our blessing. So in in chapter 2, he talks about this, and he goes to Jerusalem, and he meets with the leaders of the faith, and and he says, you know, this is what I'm teaching uh, about Judaism. This is what I'm teaching about how to disciple these churches. I'm not I'm not requiring people to take on take on Judaism to come into Christ. And James, John, and Peter, they say, awesome. Everything you're saying sounds great. We've prayed about it. We've worked through it. And, and you can read more about this in Acts 15. There's a whole council, a big meeting. This was a really, really, really big struggle the early church had. And they, they came to a conclusion. And basically what they said was, people who are pagan can come to the faith. They just need to abstain from sexual immorality and uh, remember the poor. That's basically what they were asked to do. It was a very, very low bar that they established to come into the faith. Stop sleeping around and give money to the poor. That was all it took to come into the faith. I don't know, maybe you make that the church's slogan. <laughs> Stop sleeping around, give money to the poor. Which I guess is what people think the church all is anyway these days. But um, So this is what he does. So he goes in, and in verse 8 of chapter 2, he says, James, Cephas, and Cephas is another name for Peter, and John, who are considered to be key leaders, shook hands with me and Barnabas as equals when they recognized the grace that was given to me. So here he's telling them, they recognize me as co-equal to the founders and the pillars of this faith. So if you don't think I'm qualified, go talk to Peter, go talk to James, and go talk to John, because they already gave me the stamp of approval, they shook my hand, and they asked me to simply remember the poor, he said, which was something I was willing to do. So that's verse 10. So Paul leaves with their blessing in verse 10. And verse 11 is when he opposes Peter because Peter comes and Peter starts, he's having dinner with some of the Gentiles and then some people from James comes and he goes, oh, here's some of my really, my really religious friends. I need to stop associating with these pagans because I want to look like a good, a good Jewish Christian. And then Paul comes and opposes him and that's when we see in 11, he says, I opposed him to his face because he was wrong, because he was being hypocritical in his faith. Even Peter 
was hypocritical in his execution of the Christian faith. After everything he had been through, he still struggled as a believer. Now, I don't know about you, but that's very encouraging to me that Peter, who lived with Jesus, talked with Jesus, denied Christ, was brought back to Christ, preached on Pentecost, led the church, still struggled with cultural baggage, still struggled with how do I actually follow Jesus in my life today? And that's really encouraging because we don't have to have it all figured out, right? Even Peter didn't have it figured out. And if he doesn't have it figured out, then that's a really, really low bar for me probably. So that's encouraging to me. So Paul, he tells this story, he confronts Peter, Peter apologizes, and all these things go on. So he's telling the story to them, and he, he pivots after that in chapter 3. So he finishes giving his credentials, he shows the Galatians how important this issue is to him, and now he begins in chapter 3 in probably the most Paul way possible. Galatians 3, 1, he says, <coughs> excuse me, you foolish Galatians, who put a spell on you? In other translations, it says, uh, or you irrational Galatians. Jesus Christ was put on display as crucified before your eyes. I just want to know this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so irrational? After you started with the Spirit, are you now finishing up with your own human effort? Did you experience so much for nothing? I wonder if it really was for nothing. So does the one providing you with the Spirit and working miracles among you do this by you doing the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? So now that's a lot there, but basically he's saying, again, what is going on? You started with the Spirit and now you want to take on Judaism. You started with all of these things without works and now you want to prove how good of a Christian you are, you want to prove how great of a believer you are. Why? What is the benefit to you in your faith? You already have everything you need in Christ. Why are you trying to add things to it? And, and he does it in kind of a condescending way for me, I think, personally, because really no one asks that many rhetorical questions in a row these days unless you're just kind of being a jerk to somebody. Like, are you serious? Are you thinking? Like, what is, what is going on with you right now? Like, if somebody did that to you, you'd be like, bro, back up right now. Like, just give me a minute... These are really leading. Like, if it was a courtroom show, there would be an objection for leading or berating the witness there. Um, Matlock would be all over that. Um, Thank you, Hillary. Um, So what's he doing? Because Paul also is just a really intense individual. I I firmly believe that if Paul was playing Monopoly, he would have flipped the board if he landed on go to jail too many times in one game. He'd just been like, this is unfair. I'm done. This is not worth my time anymore. And he would have walked away. But... He's, he's not being mean. He's not being too intense. What he's doing is he's inviting them to deconstruct their faith. He's inviting them to truly understand what is important to them and understand where they were and where they are and how they got there. Now, I know the term deconstruct or deconstruction can have some cultural, uh, some, it has some baggage or it can mean some different things for people. A lot of times, If someone uh, says that they've deconstructed or they're in deconstruction, it usually means that they're leaving or they have left the faith, is usually kind of what it means in in our current cultural circles right now. Um, But honestly, I kind of want to redeem that word. I want to redeem that thinking a little bit because I, I think a lot of times when people say they've deconstructed or they've left the faith, what's happened is that they've had the misfortune of being the first people in their families or their traditions or whatever to take the questions they're asking seriously enough to leave. It's not that the questions they're asking are new. It's not that the things they're thinking are new. But what it is is they finally said, you know what? This question is important enough for me to want to leave. The answers I'm getting are not what I want to hear. They're not congruent with me. I don't feel like I'm being welcome to question. So this must not be the place or the faith for me. And so they leave. So I want to I want to redeem and I want to look at that a little bit today of, of deconstruction because really what Paul is asking them he's saying did you receive did you experience by works or by grace these are very simple very easy questions for them to have but they have really deep implications for your faith so he's inviting them to look inward at the condition of their own faith before they ever look outward at the community or people coming into their faith and that's That's really my encouragement and and the reason for today is to encourage us all before unchurched, before a lot of de-churched people come in and they come in and we have assumptions, let's look inward first 
and let's do the work first and say, you know what, what do I believe and why do I believe it? Because that's really all it is. What, why, and then what do you do after that? And that's what we'll take a look at here. Because really deconstruction allows us to better understand our internal uh, composition. One of the terms used in church and theological circles when it comes to discipleship is spiritual formation. I don't know if that's a new term or you've heard that before. It's this idea that as you grow in Christ, you're kind of building something. You're being formed and you're working. And what deconstruction is, again, it's primarily for somebody that's been in the faith, is you're sitting there and you're asking, what have I built up? What have I grown into? What is around me? What is this faith structure that I'm living in? And, and what is important and what is not? Now, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a guy named Victor Belenko. Anybody? I'm, I, I assumed this reaction. So, Victor Belenko was a Russian fighter pilot. Probably not a lot of uh, Russian fighter pilot uh, aficionados in the room here. Probably not too many in the world unless you're in Russia. Um, there's probably a lot of them. He was a fighter pilot who flew what was called the MiG-25. Now, the MiG-25 was the Soviet superplane. It was the thing that we were scared of. You think about the old Cold War propaganda, this would have been right up there with, you know, the Red Scare is going to take us out with this plane. We were terrified of this plane. It flew higher, faster, and it maneuvered better than any plane we'd ever seen. And we looked at it, and we had no idea how it worked. It performed better than we thought it should. And from the outside, we had absolutely no understanding of why it could do what it could do. And for years, we guessed, we hypothesized, but in the US, we literally, in the West, we could not figure out, how can this plane do this? It makes no sense why this plane could be so good. So one day, Victor Belenko, he was a pilot. He flew these. His girlfriend had just dumped him. He lost his job. He was just kind of like, yeah, whatever. I'll defect to the US today. Why not? <laughs> so he takes off from Eastern Russia, lands in Japan, and he's like, all right, here I am. Here's this plane you've all been scared of. Go ahead. And it's just, oh my gosh, we have it. We can go look at it. And so we look at it, and what we found was this plane was a joke. It wasn't real. It flew higher than they've ever seen before, but they only ever did it once because everybody almost died. So they said, nope, can't go that high again. But they let us, the U.S., see it so that we would be scared of it. And then after that, they said, nope, we can't fly this high. We've got we to stay way down here. And it was faster than any other plane before, but it was made from steel, not any light material, so it could only fly for like five minutes. Now, that is not long in combat. That is nothing. So basically, they would take off, and they had one shot. Literally, they had one shot to shoot a plane down, and then they were out of fuel, and they had to land. So if you evaded once, you were in the clear. This plane was nothing. And so they learned that this plane has nothing, but the way that they learned all of these things, they had the testimony from the pilot, but they corroborated it. How? Because they took the plane apart. They understood how something was better constructed. They understood how something worked. How? Because they took it apart first. And when you take something apart, you understand how the inner workings connect together. And that's the same with our faith. We can look at our faith and we can say, oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christianity. Here's all the beliefs I have. Okay, well, how do they actually connect? I don't know. I just believe them. Well, what happens if you take one of them out? I don't know. I just believe them. So we, we believe what we believe, but a lot of times we don't dig in and we ask why or even how these beliefs interact with one another. Because when we deconstruct, they, they took the plan apart because they needed to understand. They had a purpose when they did it, right? They weren't just like, all right, take that bolt off, throw it away. It was a meticulous categorizing of what they were doing because deconstruction without purpose is simply destruction. So a lot of times we see people that say, oh, I deconstructed. No, you just destroyed. You took something out that you didn't like and you just walked away. You just destroyed your faith because you didn't think critically about what it actually meant with all the other pieces. So a lot of times that's what we see people do. They just destroy. Theologian John Stott, he says, the will of God for the people of God is to become like Christ. That is our purpose as believers. That is our purpose when we deconstruct. It is to look at the things that are within us that may push others away. It is to look at the things within us that are not necessarily bad, but aren't necessarily 
fully of Christ. Because when we deconstruct, we can look at the things that are of Christ and we say, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to hold on to this tight. This is Christ. This is him crucified. I'm going to hold on to it. And these other things go, you know, this is good. This is my favorite Christian artist. I love Twyla Paris. I love, you know, Hillsong. But other people cannot like those. But they can still be a believer, right? Other people can disagree about when Jesus comes back. And I love end times theology because people get so wigged out on it. And we literally have no control over it. He either comes pre-trib or post-trib, but we have no say over what that is because Jesus is just going to do what he does when he does it. And it does not matter to our faith. So that's when we deconstruct. But now when we, when we do this and we, we look through all these theological positions we have, we can pull everything apart and that's great, but you have to figure out then how do we put it back together. And again, that's where a lot of people stop is they put everything apart and they lay it all out and they go... I guess I'm done. Because you can't reconstruct without blueprints. Because if deconstruction without purpose is simply destruction, reconstruction without blueprints is simply foolish. Because unless you're a master builder, mechanic, or engineer, you probably can't just take a car apart and put it back together unless you got something telling you what to do. I had to fix my washer one time, the gasket that keeps all the water in on the front ripped. And it was very, very easy to take it apart. I had a YouTube video, oh yeah, pull that off, pull that off, pull that off. It was much, much harder to put things back on because the stakes are a lot higher when you put something back together that can leak water and flood your basement, right? And so I was meticulously watching this video. Rewind, 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 rewind. Okay, now I'll try. Oh, that doesn't look right. Rewind, rewind. Because you have to have blueprints when you put something back together. You can't just throw it back together. And so that's one of the challenges we have in the faith is well, what are our blueprints? Is because if, if we think critically and we look at our faith and we say, here's all these things that I've believed and, and maybe some of these aren't as important as others, how do I know how to put things back in what order? And there's a, there's a metric or matrix that Dr. Gary Brashear has and he divides our faith into four areas. <clears throat> Die for, divide for, debate for, and decide for. And you know it's true because it all starts with the same letter. That's a good theological thing. You know, if a preacher has points and they don't all have the same letter at the front, it's not biblical, it's not true, and this is sarcasm. So he, he, he pictures our faith as concentric circles, right? So we have die for, divide for, debate for, and decide for. And if you remember Jared's message from the Sunday after Christmas, we have this unwrapping of Jesus. What are all these things that we put on top of Jesus? That is what this is. So at the core of it, we have the die for, and that's Christ. That's the rock. That's him crucified. That is, you know, basically the Apostles' Creed. Him crucified, born of a virgin. The things that you have to believe in order to really still be Christian. Resurrection from the dead. Then you have divide for. These are things that you say, you know what? I can fully recognize that you're a Christian. I can fully recognize that you're a believer, but I'm not going to go to your church because you believe something that, honestly, I'm willing to separate for. For me and for our denomination, our faith that Jared and I are credentialed in, women in ministry is one of them. We say we value women, and we are willing to separate and make space for women in ministry. That does not mean that denominations that don't affirm women in ministry are evil, aren't making disciples, aren't bringing people to full faith in Christ. It means that this is something where we say this is important enough that we're willing to divide for. Now, there's a lot of churches that divide for reasons that are not divide for issues, right? And we see that a lot. And a lot of times what happens is, you know, you have a church, they say everything we believe is divide for. And if you're not in this church, you're not in faith. If you don't go to this church, you're not a true believer because we've got it figured out. 1,900 years later, our little group of 100 people got together in a conference and we finally solved Christianity, right? No, no, that's not what happens. So you have the divide for, then you have the debate for. These are issues that can be very contentious. You can disagree strongly in. Politics is a debate for. A lot of people, we want to make politics a divide for. Personally, that is not a divide for for me. It is a debate for because there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no male nor female, slave nor free in Christ. The things that we divide ourselves in politically, culturally, ethnically, do not divide us in Christ. 
So you can disagree vehemently with somebody in their politics, but if they say, you know what, I serve Jesus, and I believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead for my sins, you can unite and live in harmony with that person. Because you agree on the things that matter. You are linking arms in the die for, not the divide for. And these are just debate for things. But you can be very contentious with them. Politics are very important. And they can be bad. You can take things the wrong way. And I think a lot of times what happens is this, this idea of, oh, well, don't make things too important in your life. That's true. But the reality is this world is important to us. These things in the world are important. It's okay to say this issue, this thing is very, very important to me. And it's okay for somebody to say the opposite side of that issue is very, very important to me, but we still love each other, we still serve Jesus, and we're going to come and break bread together and show the world that true unity is not in homogeneity. It's not the same thinking. It's not the same doing. True unity in Christ is that we are all sinners. We are all broken. We all come from different backgrounds. It doesn't matter what we are, but we choose to follow Jesus. And everything that is debate for, everything that is divide for, in the end, all of that falls away. And the only thing that's left standing is our faith. Paul says in Corinthians 3, we're all building something. And at the end, fire will come and it will test our works. It will test what we do. And if we build on Christ, we will stand. And if we don't build on Christ, everything will burn away. And that's pretty sobering. Now, the last thing is the decide for. And that's pretty much what it is. That's musical styles, preferences. These are the things where you say, you know, I like it if we do it this way, but eh, that's just me. But it's okay to have preference because, you know, there's musical styles. I go, you know, God bless them. That's not for me. That's never going to appear on my Spotify playlist <laughs> at all. However, I fully recognize that that can make someone weep in the presence of God. It can do something in their heart that I don't understand that will never probably ever do it in my heart, right? But I can recognize and decide that's for them not for me. I will honor what the Lord is doing in their heart, but I'm not going to impose my preferences on them and tell them that they're wrong. And that's really what the decide for is. And now it may feel weird to stack rank theology, stack rank items, like a fantasy draft of, of beliefs. It's not what I'm saying here, but this is what Paul is commending them to doing. He's saying, I have chosen that unity and faith is more important than my Judaism. I have chosen that this is more important. It's okay if you want to still be Jewish. Go for it. That's part of Romans. He talks about the beauty of the law that is there and how it brought people to Christ and how there was beauty in it. But he's saying, we don't need to put it on those who aren't already in it. Aren't already in it. And honestly, in Christianity, we do that. It is okay for a long-term believer to say, my faith and my traditions have brought so much value to me and they have formed me so beautifully it's okay to say that, but then also go, but you don't need them. You don't need my traditions. You don't need the things that are important to me. What you need is Jesus. And what you need to figure out is what is Jesus saying to you? And that's what this does. That's what this deconstruction does, is it allows us to, one, identify and say, thank God for the work you've done in my life. Thank God for the things that you've brought in my life, the ways that you've grown me, the ways that you've developed me. But God, help me to see the things you want to do in others. And help me to understand that what you want to do in them is not necessarily what you did for me, through me, or in me. Help me to have the humility to understand every person is made in the image of God and that every person has a unique story that God wants to honor and bring them into fellowship with him. And guide them and say, hey, what you're doing, probably cultural. That's okay. Oh, now you've stepped into sin. Okay, let's correct this. Let's look at scripture for the behaviors we're trying to address. But we can do that in fellowship. That's right. You can't, you can't call somebody out on something unless you're friends with them. And, and having a better understanding of who we are allows us to better interact and create space in our lives and in our hearts for others. Because if somebody comes in and they say, oh my gosh, God, casting crowns. I do not like casting crowns. And maybe you love casting crowns. That can be a hard thing to hear. That can be offensive. And it's okay to be hurt by that. 
because it's something that's precious to you. It's music that maybe has ministered to you. It's okay to acknowledge that what this person just said, probably flippant, probably not in the best attitude. However, that's a decide for item. I can let that go. I can forgive that person for something they said, and I can move in fellowship with them and go. So when we, when we understand where these items are, when new believers, when people who've come and have been hurt by the church, and when people who've been hurt by the church come back to the church, they will want to hurt the church. They will want to make people feel the way that they felt. Not all the time, but hurt people hurt people. And when people come back to church, it can be very hard and very painful for them because it reminds them of the things that they were hurt by. Even if it's good now, it still reminds them. And so they will interact and they can say things that can be hurtful to you because church is precious to you because we've been in church, we've grown in church. But we have to understand they're coming from a different perspective and they're saying things that hurt me, but they're not, they're not denigrating Christ. They're not rejecting Jesus with what they're saying. So I can forgive them. I can give grace to that. They're fine. It hurts me, but I forgive them. I will be mature and I will let them come in because the whole point of life, the whole point of faith is in community. And that's what this does. When you, when you pull things apart and you put it back together and you understand how your faith is working, you understand where these items are, and you understand that really the die for is what matters, and the divide for, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of work with the divide for, because honestly, it's hard to be in fellowship and relationship with somebody you're, you're willing to divide with. Probably best to just bless them and send them to somebody who they agree with on that level. Because if somebody says, women should be silent, and you're like, I think women should probably be able to preach, probably going to be hard to find a lot of commonality on a lot of things. But you can say, you know what, bless you, seek Christ. Here's a church that I know is good. They teach this. I disagree with it, but you know what, there's good people that go there. Let me get you connected to a friend of mine that's there. You can do that. Because when you, when you understand the cultural things that might push people away, what you do is, is your circle, your little bubble, your buffer that might push people away gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what you're able to do is you're able to bring people closer and closer and closer in who need Jesus. Because faith is meant to be done in community. Faith is meant to be done with one another. And when we understand the things that might push others away, that might off-put others about our own faith, about our own Christianity, and we can say, this is good, and I love it, and I adhere it, but they don't need it, you can put that wall down for them, and you can let them come in closer. And that's what faith is about. It's to live in the Spirit. So my conclusion really is this. We deconstruct to understand ourselves and we rebuild appropriately so that we make space for others in our lives. But how, how do we do this? Do we do it in an annual weekend retreat where we write down all of our beliefs and we categorize and we throw it up on a whiteboard and we say, okay, uh, this doctrine I'm going to put in divide for, this doctrine I'm going to put in decide for. No, you could do that, but that's probably not terribly practical to do that. Paul, Paul gives us the how to do this in Galatians. In Galatians 5, 16, he says, I say, be guided by the Spirit, and you won't carry out your selfish desires. Life by the Spirit enables you to make these decisions in a snap moment. When you feel somebody coming up against you, and you feel them this tension coming against what you believe is a decide for or debate for, we have the Spirit within us to say, okay, Jesus, I'm kind of offended I'm really annoyed by this person right now, but where are they coming at? What are they butting up against within me? Is this a decide for? Is this a divide for, a debate for? What is going on in our faith conversation right now? And the Spirit will help us. In 5.16, he says, be guided by the Spirit. In Galatians 6.2, he says, carry each other's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.10, he says, work for the good of all whenever you have an opportunity especially for those in the household of faith. Because when we lean on the Spirit in humility, we consider others better than ourselves. And from that attitude, we serve alongside those within our community. Because the reality is that for any of us to survive life with our faith intact, it must be done with one another. It must be done in community. And that's why it's so imperative for us to do the hard work of deconstruction to determine what within us is a barrier to others, and do the work of reconstruction marked by humility to ensure that we keep peace and grace with those around us. Because this life and this faith were not meant to be lived alone. 
And when we place unnecessary burdens on those that wish to join our communities, we are unnecessarily making our Christianity a law unto ourselves. We become Pharisees when we do that. We say, here's the things you have to do. Jesus is great, but you got to listen to this kind of music now. Jesus is great, but we probably should start uh, dressing a little more appropriately. Jesus is great, but stop going to Packer games now because church is more important. Jesus is great, but... And we do all these things, and all it does is it places burden, unnecessary burden, because we should let the Spirit work within them. And instead of saying, this is what you got to do, say, hey, why, why are the Packers so important to you? Oh, it's the only time my dad and I talk. Go. Be blessed. Go. Connect with your loved one that doesn't know Jesus. Why do you want to go do this? Well, because it's important to me because of this. Awesome. Go. Be blessed. Ask questions, not of yourself, but others, in the same way that Paul did. So let's deconstruct together, pursuing the purpose of Christ, and let's reconstruct together, guided by the Spirit to build a community that bears each other's burdens. Because holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is his name. There will come a day when it doesn't matter nation or theology or thought. All that will matter is that you love Jesus and that you love others. And church, let's be a place where people come and they don't feel Christianity, they feel Christ. Let's be a place where they come and they feel the work of the Spirit, not the work of the law, where they feel life and not death because that is what Christ came. He talked to people and he didn't make them Jewish. He just made them believe in him as the Messiah. We don't need to make people Christian. We need to make people Christ followers. Make them pointed to Christ. Guide them to Christ. Let Christ work in their hearts and be a beloved brother and sister that they can trust and come to when they have questions. Not somebody that comes to them and says, you need to get your life in order. You need to do these things. That is not faith. That is not discipleship. So let's be a place where all people can come and live and worship freely.